are in week number two of our new series, All In. Last week, we uh, jumped in with the first message, Deny Yourself. And if you were unable to be here, as a reminder, we um, are recording every week, archiving it on our YouTube page and on our website, expecthopechurch.com. And through the app. If you don't have the app, if you do, it's all in there. Download the app through Church Center, and uh, you can find all the messages. So today I want to talk about week two in this series, all in how to live like Jesus. And I want to specifically talk today about arming the mind. Arming the mind. So I want to begin with this scripture. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, it says this, For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach him? But we understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, for the next few moments, let the word penetrate the ears and the hearts of every man and woman, boy and girl, and every person online. Holy Spirit, I thank you. I am just a vessel. Father, Lord, you do the speaking, and we receive what you want to speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Arming the mind. It's kind of an interesting thought, potentially, but we are discussing about how to be all in, how to live like Jesus. And last week, as we talked about sin, that sin does have power, but we also learned that we have authority over that power of sin with a greater power through Jesus Christ. That without Christ, the power of sin does have victory. But as we know in Scripture, it says, death, where is your sting? When Jesus conquered the grave and we receive Christ, we start walking in a power and authority we would have not had any other way. So thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph in his name. That's what the word teaches us. And so there is a battleground that goes on, and it really comes against our mind because the mind is the throne. The mind is the seat of authority for your life because in your mind begins every thought and every action. That in your mind is the place where decisions are made. In your mind is the place where you choose to go left or go right, to go forward or go backwards, to live in fear or walk victoriously, even in the face of fear. That the real war we're talking about starts and takes place in our minds. So you better believe that there is an enemy that's coming after your mind. But this is why Philippians 2, 5 is good news for us. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, that it is available for us as Christian brothers and sisters to walk and have and live in the mind of Christ. And all of God's people say amen. Amen. So I want to talk for a second about the attacks of Satan. And the incredible defensive measures that God has given us through his word that we can proactively use on a daily basis. Now, uh, as a person who lives on the earth and growing up in church, there was a lot of preaching I heard my, my whole life by hundreds of preachers. I was blessed to be around. But many times, especially when I was younger, a lot of times the messages would go over my head. I didn't know how to practically engage into the word at times. Maybe you have felt like this. Maybe you haven't. But for me, it was a struggle for a while. And I began to say, God, how do I not only receive the faith words of understanding, but Lord, teach me the practical side. Lord, I want to know when I wake up in the morning, my alarm's going off, you know, and and it's time to go for the day. How do I handle life according to your word? I I don't just want to theoretically understand. I want to proactively on a daily basis have the authority you've told me I have. And how does that supposed to look in life? I don't want to emulate the world. I want to emulate you. And so a lot of the times when you hear me preach or teach, I am teaching from that perspective and that posture. I'm, I'm big on practical. I'm big on tangible. I'm big on making sure that our faith walk is not something that's uh, for something 50 years from now, but it's for right now in this moment in this room. It's for when you leave this room and you go into the world today and go to lunch and encounter people or go to the store, or go to work, wherever you're headed after this, that Christ has called us to live a life of victory today. Everybody say today. So the enemy is coming against that today also. 
How many of you know that there's a tax you might be battling today? Anybody understand that or feel that today? And the reality of that is you don't get to control the attacks that come against you, but you do get to control your reaction and your response in every single way according to the word. So I want to read Ephesians 6, 11. It says, it's put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Wiles, that's a good old King James word, isn't it? Wiles is just another word for schemes or strategies, but it relates to us because we have to understand that Satan is coming at you with a strategy. There are things that you are tempted with that other people just aren't tempted with and vice versa. That you might be struggling with certain things, thoughts, fears, addictions, uh, temptations. You can fill in the blank that the enemy is going to attack you very specifically to your weaknesses. Do you ever remember the old uh, Greek mythology story about Achilles? And he had the heel. That was his secret weakness, right? You know, and you have these things that we learn in school or maybe you hear about that, oh, this guy was invincible except for the one weakness, the heel, the Achilles heel, right? And so every one of us has a, quote, Achilles heel, and some of us have a lot more than that, don't we? <laughs> and so without the shield and the power of Jesus protecting us, we're pretty vulnerable. And so you have to understand the enemy, even as a saved Christian, and you're in your armor of God, put on the whole armor of God. Why? So you can stand against the attacks of the enemy, the strategies of the enemy, the schemes of the enemy. Even after you surrender your life to Christ, you are still getting attacked. Can anybody relate in the room by chance? I know I can. Because, man, we go through some attacks, Terry and I, and we have to say, my goodness, where's this coming from? But this scripture says, hey, just because you're walking as a Christian doesn't mean the attacks stop. In fact, I believe sometimes they increase because the enemy doesn't like warriors. The enemy doesn't like somebody tearing down the gates of hell. But I tell you what, my calling is to do just that. So even though he doesn't like it, I'm still coming, baby. Are you with me in this place today? That God has called us to be a world changer. God has called us to be a world shaker. And that means that we stand up against the attacks of the enemy. We look at him eye to eye and know that we got his number. And in fact, that's why he's so terrified of you, because he knows that you know that you got his number. Jesus already won. So we have to walk with that kind of confidence. Well, how do you walk with that kind of confidence? That's what we're going to talk about today. But you have to understand, first, there are wiles of the devil. There are schemes. There are strategies. He's coming after your weaknesses. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, we are not ignorant of his devices. Or mind games. A device is a scheming of the mind. He's coming after your mind. We're not ignorant of the mind games that the devil tries to pull on us. So when we look at wiles and devices, we're talking about that Satan works to get a foothold in your life. He's working to try and pull a device on you, which is a scheming or messing with your mind. So there is an attack coming for you. But I got good news. Come on, let's keep going. Let's talk about the pulling down of these strongholds. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against woo, the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Oh, my goodness. Hallelujah. Hold that scripture for me because this is one of the most powerful, proactive revelations of faith that you can grab as a believer this morning. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So as we pause there, what are some of the things that you do know about the knowledge of God about your life? First of all, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Anything that comes against that and says that you're not wonderful, cast it out. You are gifted and guided and created according to the calling that God has for your life. Anything that would say you're worthless and invaluable is a lie of the enemy. 
You are designed to fulfill a strategic purpose right here on this earth, no matter how you entered this world, no matter how uh, the odds were stacked against you, no matter how even horrific potentially your childhood may have been, or a, a, a horrible thing that happened to you even at a young age. There are stories in this room, if we pass the microphone, that we could weep for days, weeks, months, and even years in this place. It's painful, real life, hardship, but we have to understand that according to Romans, God works all things together for good for those who love him. So there are arguments coming against you. There are attacks coming against you, but casting down the arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. All right, here we go. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Every thought. Every, can we say that? Say every thought. Every thought. Have you ever had a thought that the second you thought, you're like, that's not a good thought? Come on, raise your hand. If you don't raise your hand, you're a liar. Come on, you. <laughs> How do I know that? Because the Bible says that we're all tempted. Jesus was tempted in every way, yet without sin. So believe me, if Jesus was tempted, that means Jesus had moments where a bad thought entered his mind. That means there are moments where a, a, a pretty girl walked by and Jesus' thoughts may have went, whoa, that's a pretty girl. But what happens, he brings it into captivity. How do you bring those thoughts into captivity? I, I mentioned this last week. I, I love this quote by the famous evangelist Billy Graham, one of my favorites, by the way. He said, the temptation of sin is not sin. It's the yielding to the temptation. That there are many moments in life you will be tempted to do the wrong thing but the temptation in and of itself is not sinful why it's the opportunity to bring it into captivity are you with me this morning if you are say oh yeah all right we're clicking we have to bring into captivity every thought that comes against God and the best for your life I have seen in my life with Christians, non-Christians, even leaders in the church who let a moment of foolishness destroy their entire life because the enemy was scheming and pushing and he was relentless. And if that defense gets dropped and we don't put those thoughts into captivity, those thoughts start running wild. They gain a foothold on our life and eventually something called a stronghold. Now let's talk about a stronghold. A stronghold means a fortress and a prison that you could call modern day prison a stronghold. They have detention or holding tanks, dungeons or jails, high walls and defensive mechanisms. There was, uh, when we lived in Arizona, we, we were near a federal penitentiary and it was serious. I mean, when you drive, it didn't have one chain link fence. It had like three. <laughs> and they all had barbed wire and they had towers with snipers and just like the movies. This, you know, I'm sure you've seen them yourself somewhere in your journeys and travels in life. But what's the purpose of that? The design is how do we keep these people inside here? That when you talk about a stronghold, another word could be a citadel, a fort, a castle. When we were in London last year, we did a group trip to uh, Albania. How many were able to go on that trip, by the way? Let me see. A few of you in the room. It was fun, wasn't it? One of the days we went to London on the way home, and there was a very famous um, place called the Tower of London. That was my first time going to see it. It's a tourist site now, but the Tower of London's history was the most terrifying fortress they had because inside the tower was the torture chambers. And so once you got past the big walls and all that, and if you went there as a prisoner, it was bad news for you. And you can actually walk into these torture rooms and all those types of things, and it's an eerie feeling, you know? Like, man, the horrible things that took place. What is it? It's a stronghold, an infamous stronghold. See, the, the enemy is trying to get some walls built in your life. He's trying to get a stronghold. He's trying not to uh, create something to where you can't get in. He's trying to keep you inside of his bondage. 
And so when a foothold becomes a stronghold, what happens is that there is a prison that gets created in your mind. And if you're not careful, you might feel like you can never break free. You might feel that thing that's with you at all times will always be with you. But I have good news today. Jesus breaks every chain. Jesus destroys every wall. There is nothing too great for our God. We sing a song, Reckless Love, and there's a line. There's no wall you won't kick down. Oh, I like that line. Do you know when that line came out, there's a lot of controversy in the church. I just can't believe God would kick a wall down. Believe me, if that's what it takes, he'd kick a wall down. You just read the book of Acts when uh, the apostles were in prison and earthquakes opened prison doors and angels opened gates and kicked doors open, literally. God is a wall kicker, okay? He likes to kick down walls, and the same is true for you and your life, that there is no wall he won't kick down down when you call out unto his name you have power through christ that you don't have without him but with him he can bring every stronghold and destroy it and bring it down and bring every thought into captivity and into submission to the glory of his name hallelujah we have authority can we all say the word say authority Authority from heaven is something that is not lightly paid for. It was paid for with the blood of Jesus. But it is something that you have access to if you try by faith and surrender your life unto him. In Ephesians six seventeen, it says, take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. This is uh, talking about the mind, isn't it? Now, the Roman soldiers wore these incredible helmets. They had big flumes on the top and feathers or designs. And it was a very ornate thing. It was noticeable. It was an identity for the soldier. And many of the lower uh, soldiers had the same helmet. But as you climbed in the ranks, the different officers would have a little bit special helmets. They can customize them, you know. They can make them different or special. If they had nicknames, they would put the... You know, oh, that's the elephant general. I don't know, I'm making this up. You know, and they put an elephant on the side. If they were the, the lion general, you know, they put a lion. But they had all these different insignias and different things they could add to their helmet in order to show their identity off. And not only that, the helmet wasn't just a piece of art, but it was powerful piece of protection. That in the battles, the highest class of helmet was impregnable even to axes and swords directly striking it. That... They were incredibly powerful in the defensive capability that they had. And so when you read about take the helmet of salvation, that in Ephesians it's paralleling the helmet was defensive, wasn't it? That it was a defensive mechanism and piece of armor and tool that were worn by the soldiers. And so salvation is the same way that salvation is part of our new birth. But when we are walking and the fruit of our salvation, you have a defense against every wile and scheme that the enemy has against you. When you say take the helmet of salvation, it also is another word for it. It's receive. That the helmet is not just something you pick up off the ground, but it's something that is given to you. You are receiving this helmet. You are placing it on top of your head, your throne. The most important place in a soldier's body was his head, of course, because if the head's gone, the body's gone. And the same is true with your thinking, that if your thinking is gone, the rest of you can be gone. And so the salvation of Christ does just that. It protects you against the most strategic attacks that can come Against you. First Peter 1.13 says, Gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Everybody say sober. sober. And hope to the end of the grace that is to be brought into you, unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, gather up the loose ends of your mind. Get your mind in good shape. Your knowledge of your salvation produces life. It produces deliverance from sin, salvation from hell, divine protection through his wisdom. That's an important one, isn't it? 
produces preservation, healing. How important is that? When you've gone through something that should have took you out, but you're still barely getting by. Do you know what the most sought after profession is when you've gone through a tragedy? Therapy. Counseling. Why? We need help with our minds, don't we? That your mind is, uh, mental health is a, kind of became a big buzzword, if you will, during COVID. It's always been around for a long time, but it really increased the, the eyes of our country and awareness of the importance of mental health. So when we're talking about mental health, what were you we really talking about through faith? Let's take it another level even higher. We're to, I, I don't want just mental health. I want mental freedom in Jesus. Amen. I, I want the ability to have my mind be in Christ. I want the mind of Christ. And we're talking about the series. I want to be all in how to live like Jesus. So what we're talking about today is how do I have the mind of Christ? If you can think like Jesus, you will act like Jesus. Oh, that's so good. I got to say it again. If you can think like Jesus, you will act like Jesus. And if our mind is not consumed on the things of the word, not consumed on his law and his love for us, we'll act just like the world acts because our thoughts and mind will be on other things. But as we start to think like Christ, you start walking in the fruit of that reality. How do you receive this helmet? Number one, read your word. Let us never, and I pray we never take for granted, the power of the Holy Scripture. It is God's living word for our life. If we are not actively, on a daily basis, reading the word, we are not walking in the truth and understanding and knowledge and the power that it provides us. Read the word. And that can be a little scary sometimes. Like, God, I'm so busy, I don't have time for this. Start small, start simple. Number one, get a Bible. Don't just have it on your phone. I mean, I have Bibles on my phones and iPads and all that. That's fine. But believe me, I have several physical Bibles. Put it on your nightstand. Put it somewhere you'll see it. I have one in my car. And I put it, uh, Dr. Hickey taught Terry and I this. I put it in my side, you know, in your car. Don't just fill it with trash. You know, like put, put your Bible in there. And uh, so we put, I put my Bible in my car. Then if I'm at a, a, a fast food, you know, you ever get stuck in traffic or like we're going to pick our child up and we just have a few minutes, I can pull my Bible out and just open it up and read a few scriptures. It's an amazing thing when you make the word accessible to your life, how you'll engage into it. And it's, it's different than any other book. This is something that will absolutely transform your life. Number two, expand your faith. You can't expand your faith without reading the word, amen. Number three, go to church. Hallelujah. You're checking that box today, Amen. And you know, going to church is not hopefully a get into heaven free card, you know. Sometimes people have the wrong perspective of church that we think, well, I have to. This is my duty. And sure, there's a part of that, maybe. But this is not about an obligation, and hopefully God won't be mad at me if I show up to church. This is about walking in the transformed power and love and life that he has for you. This is about receiving the mind of Christ, and also it's about getting around other brothers and sisters in Christ so we can lean on each other, pray with each other, and undergird each other. And number four, live your faith. Do it through prayer. Do it through your actions. It is an activation. Do not be the Christian who keeps it all to yourself. The best way to learn something is to teach it. Have you ever learned it? Anybody ever had to do that? If you're part of this church, you probably have had to right here in this church at least. But you're just getting learning and you're just kind of in the beginning. And then the first thing you're trying to do now is teach somebody else. And it's actually one of the best ways to learn. Do you know the same is true with your faith? That as you're learning the word of God, and hey, you got to love people. You got to you got to share your faith. And then you're trying to teach somebody who knows less than you. The best thing you can do is like watch watch me do it. And you're thinking, I don't even know what I'm doing. But because you're trying to teach someone else, you're going to step out further in faith because you have to now. That's one of the best ways to activate your faith. Take proactive action. All right. Last scripture today. Second Timothy one seven. God hath not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Hallelujah. The enemy wants to take your mind. He operates through what? Fear. Fear can cripple your mind. Therefore, cripple your actions. God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, though. He's given you power, love, 
in a sound mind. What is a sound mind? Wise thinking, sensible thinking, intelligent thinking. A sound mind literally translates to a saved mind or a delivered mind. You have a mind that is armed by the blood of Jesus, the power of God. You have victory and authority over every thought the enemy may throw at you. Hallelujah. Let's give God a praise for that today. So, Nikita, this time you can come forward. And, and here's what I want us to do. We're talking about some of the, the practical, right? Well, how do I take this word and apply it to my life? Number one, as we pray here and we conclude our service, I want to pray that you, more than ever, get a hunger for God. Do you know, that's, that's where things begin, really. Have you ever been really full with food? Anybody ever, like, eaten too much? Okay, we've all been there, right? You're just like, oh. So if in that moment, this happened the other day, I was traveling, and I, I ate at a different time than my family ate. And then when it came time for them to be hungry, I wasn't quite there yet. And they were like, oh, I'm so hungry because it's been hours since they had eaten, but I wasn't quite there yet. And they're like, where do you want to go? I'm like, I really don't. I'm not hungry, right? I don't care. where, Right? And I kind of had this lethargy, like, I don't know. Right? Because I didn't have that desire to eat yet. That's a very natural thing. Let's talk about hunger of God now. If you don't have a hunger for God, you're just going to, yeah, whatever. Go to church this month. Eh. Does it matter? Right? Without a hunger, we're just kind of floating around a little bit. Now, how, let's flip it. How many have been, like, really hungry? You missed a few meals, you know? You didn't even mean to, right? So we all know that feeling. Isn't it amazing how any food sounds unbelievable? You're like, I don't, I don't normally think about 7-Eleven hot dogs, but I could kill me one of those things right now. I know it's sitting out for 18 days, but I want one. I mean, when you're hungry, I mean, you, it, it just changes. You just want it all. You want anything. I want nachos, popcorn, give me cheesy cheese in a cheese stick. I'll even eat one of those big nasty pickles in the package that's not even cold. Horrible. But if I'm hungry enough. So today as we talk about prayer, what would be my first prayer for you to go deeper, to get the mind of Christ? Hunger for God. That if you get a hunger for the Lord, woo, things begin to change. I'm going to use my brother here. I didn't ask him, but I hope he's okay. Brother Adam, he went to Nepal, and he came back. We had a moment to sit and talk. But he looked at me, and he said, this trip changed me. And all he could say is, I, I want God. Like, I'm hungry for more. I, I need more. There was something triggered in his spirit, only by heaven, that heaven does through his faith action of going on this trip, right? He took the faith action to go on the trip, but in response to that obedience, God honored him, and now there's something triggering on the inside, and it's this hunger. I would say it becomes almost an insatiable faith hunger where you just want more and more and more. And you know what's so amazing about the Lord? There's no end to it. Oh, I've experienced all there is with God. Nope. That's self-righteous. There's no end to him. As much as we could ever experience on this earth, I believe, as the old saying goes, the tip of the iceberg, right? We've just experienced a little bit to compare to what we will experience one day in glory. So let's do this. Let's stand to our feet if you're able, and let's pray today as we conclude. And I want to pray for that hunger to just stir in our hearts. Even if you're, well, I'm hungry for God. Well, I pray it increases. I pray you can't even sleep. I pray that you just want to pray. I pray that you just want to just get even deeper. Come on, let's pray for that. And I want you to join in with me because this is the key to victory this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, I stretch forth my faith and unite it with every person, every person online, every person in this room for an increase of hunger in Jesus' name.
Lord, let there be an insatiable desire to know you, an insatiable feeling, God, to get more and more and more of you. Lord, that's where the keys to miracles are unlocked. That's where faith begins to overcome the enemy. Lord, that's where we start walking and living in the mind of Christ. That's where we start seeing the temptations that come our way. It might be temptation of lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, or pride of life, but we start recognizing it and start realizing, oh, we actually have authority over this lord it starts with that hunger so lord let a hunger be stirred in jesus mighty name lord i pray it just starts going in a deeper intense way father lord i just believe that lord you will do something fresh lord we are believing for our city lord we are believing for a move of your powerful holy spirit and lord that begins when the church gets hungry hallelujah so lord let us arm our minds let us go all in how to live like you lord reveal it to us show it to us lord do your miracles in ways that we can't even understand lord let the hunger increase in jesus name a hunger for your word a hunger for your presence a hunger for the people of this world to change the world for you in the love of christ father i thank you that's going to increase and lord i thank you when that increases we start walking in victory like never before so we give this day to you we give our lives to you and lord today lord you honor the prayers of your people lord there might be some in here not praying for this they won't get anything but those who want it father you honor the prayers of those who are saying no 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 that's not that that's for me today i'm hungry god increase 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 god that's where the doors open though that's where the miracles are that's where the blessing is that's where the favor is father lord we want everything you have for our lives and for our families so lord i thank you and we put sin underneath our feet we put every while of the enemy underneath our feet every device of the enemy underneath our feet we take authority over with the helmet of salvation and god we declare our mind is armed and ready with the mind of christ and lord we give it unto you today and we thank you for it move in a mighty way in jesus name holy spirit move today in a powerful way in jesus name amen and amen let's clap our hands and give god an awesome praise for that today y'all i love you i'm so thankful you've been in church today i pray you have an, inc <laughs> an incredible memorial day and uh we love y'all next sunday we're gonna keep going in our series and we are gonna talk about walking in wisdom don't miss next sunday as we talk about walking in wisdom okay this is where we're gonna go deeper and heavier in this thing. We love y'all. Have a great week. <laughs> God bless you. Hey, thank you so much for watching today, and I pray the message was a blessing to your life. If you want to stay up to date with all things Expect Hope, subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on social media. You know, we can't do what we do without you. And if you'd like to make a donation to our ministry, please go to Expect Hope Church. Dot com. You know, it's impossible to meet all the needs without so many faithful supporters just like you. Thank you for your consideration. And if you're ever in the Denver area, we invite you to come join us for a service on Sunday morning. God bless you.